Hi guys, welcome to Sale of Goods Part 2. In this video, we are going to be focusing on implied conditions in a contract for sale of goods. And so if you haven't had a chance to watch a video until the end, please consider watching this video to the end so that you understand how the six implied conditions in a contract for sale of goods operate and you will be in a position to apply these six implied conditions to any problem and come up with a solution. But before we go into that discussion, I want us to understand what terms of a contract mean and distinguish them from representations. And so when we talk about terms of a contract, what we mean here is that these are undertakings and promises contained in a contract. If you come across a contract document, you will find terms. Maybe party A is to do 1, 2, 3 and party B is to do 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah? So those are what we call terms of a contract. Now on the other side, representations are statements made before a contract is entered into and these are not intended to form part of a contract. So that is a distinction between terms of a contract and representations. Now furthermore to this, when it comes to terms of a contract, they can either be express terms or implied terms. And so as far as again uh, express terms are concerned, these are written um, clearly in a contract, um, while implied terms are not written in a contract, meaning that parties may consider them so obvious that they don't see the need to write them in the contract. So what you see written in a contract, if you have a physical contract document, um, under terms, those are express terms. Now with this uh, brief introduction, um, our key discussions are going to be focusing on conditions and warranties. Next uh, slides. And I want us to understand what is the distinction between a warranty and condition. When I enter a supermarket and I'm told, um, buy this fridge, you have a warranty for two years. What does it mean? Yeah? Is it a condition? Is it a warranty? What, what do they mean when they tell me I have a warranty for two years? And so with that in mind, to begin with conditions, when we say uh, that this is a condition to a contract, what we mean uh, is that this is a vital term going to the root of a contract, meaning that a breach of this condition entitles the injured party to rescind the contract and sue for damages. So a condition goes to the root of a contract. Yeah, It is the foundation, it's the basis of that contract. It's the main reason why you entered into that contract, meaning that should a part of that contract breach a condition, you're entitled uh, to, number one, rescind the contract. By rescind, what I mean is that you can cancel the contract. And on top of cancelling the contract, you sue for damages. And so, as a law student, uh, the case in mind here is uh, Wallace versus Brad. Uh, remember that when we have arguments as lawyers or as law students or as um, any person um, attempting to do a law exam, you need to back up your facts uh, using case law. And so moving on to the next uh, slide, which speaks to a warranty. Um, a warranty is not a vital term. Yeah, you've already seen the distinction. While a condition is a vital term, a warranty is not a vital term, meaning that it does not go to the root of a contract, but merely is, a second, is, is actually second to the main purpose of a contract. When we say collateral to the main purpose of a contract, in side too. So what I mean here is that it is not the essence of the reason why you entered into a contract. It is just a side thing, meaning that should it be breached, uh, what you can claim for are uh, damages, uh, but you do not have a right to treat the contract as uh, repudiated. And so what do I mean when I say repudiated? Here repudiated means revoking. So when a contract um, has a warranty that has been breached, you cannot claim to revoke that contract. All you can get are damages um, as far as that contract is concerned. Put this into perspective. If you go buy a fridge and you promise a warranty for two years, then after two months you discover there is a fault in this fridge, the best you can get is a claim for damages. You can never revoke uh, the contract uh, you entered into uh, with that supermarket where you bought the fridge. Again, the case in question here that you can use uh, to back up the definition of a warranty 
is the case of uh, Bettini versus Guy. Now, having understood what a term means, what a representation means, um, the categories of terms which are both expressed and implied, and then we've talked about distinctions between a condition and a warranty, I want you again to look at section 13 of the Sale of Goods Act. Now, section 13 of the Sale of Goods Act states that whether term is a condition or a warranty depends on the construction of the contract. So, oh, again, always have this at the back of your mind. And so, moving at the main um, area of discussion, which is uh, the implied conditions in a contract for sale, uh, the first condition is that uh, the seller has to be the right, uh, rather, the seller has to have the right to sell the goods at the point at which property passes. So when you check section 14a, at the point at which property passes, you must uh, have the right to actually sell those goods. And this is the first implied condition as uh, parties enter into a contract for sale of goods. And so using an example here is that if person A sells a car to person B, it turns out that the car didn't belong to person A, Person B can be able to sue and claim for the total price, purchase price of that car and have all his money back, while person C, the rightful owner of the car, comes to repossess his car. So this is the essence of section 14A. Now moving on to section 15, uh, this is another key section. Remember that uh, if a sale of goods is by description, uh, these goods must match that description or rather, they must correspond to that description. An example here is that if I buy 100 boxes of sanitizers and I'm told each box contains 30 bottles of small sanitizers, and when these boxes are delivered to me, I discover that actually some boxes contain uh, maybe 24 bottles of sanitizers. So you can already see that in this uh, scenario, um, the sale of goods, which in this case are sanitizers, they're being sold to me by description, but the, the goods do not correspond to the description because some boxes contain lesser bottles of sanitizers. So this is what section 15 speaks to. Again, the case in question uh, is the Remo case. Moving on to um, the next key um, implied condition in a contract for sale of goods. Here, this um, condition provides that where goods are bought by description from a seller uh, who deals in goods of that description, whether that person is a manufacturer of those goods or a supplier of those uh, goods, uh, those goods must be of quality. Yeah. So this is section 16b, a very key section. And so I want to put this section in perspective so that you remember it as you encounter many discussions on matters sale of goods. Now the scenario here I want to give, I want to make this so practical so that you understand when can you apply section 16b in a discussion. And so as you can see from your screens, um, if Jen uses Instagram to source for lipstick for resale, so Jen wants uh, to source for uh, lipstick for resale, uh, while searching on Instagram she comes across a company called XX Beauty. Um, which is best um, in industrial area and uh, supplies cos uh, cosmetic products uh, to different uh, parts of Kenya. And so XX Beauty has in stock some lipstick which is described on its Instagram page as free from beeswax and good for African skin. So you can see here that uh, Jen is looking for, number one, she's looking for lipstick uh, and this uh, lipstick, she goes on Instagram, searches and finds XX Beauty, and XX Beauty says it actually offers lipstick which is uh, free from uh, beeswax and good for African uh, skin, warranted only, um, equal to sample, meaning that um, you can even be given a sample to find out how this uh, lipstick works. So in this case, what happens if the lipstick does not, in fact, um, or rather, what happens in the instance that the lipstick does in fact contain beeswax and is not uh, suitable um, for people and it will cause allergies. Remember uh, beeswax is um, a chemical that could be 
allergic to uh, people but um, as far as this example is concerned beauty xx has said its lipstick does not contain beeswax so this is a description that has been given by the supplier of this lipstick what happens in this circumstance should you actually get uh, this lipstick of course jen has been given this lipstick and if she finds out that this lipstick in fact um, contains uh, beeswax and it causes allergies uh, to um, her clients then jen can be able to rely on section 16b to say that uh, the description of the goods by the seller who, in, who is in this case uh, xx beauty did not meet i mean the description of the goods uh, didn't meet uh, the quality uh, of the goods she was looking for the other section that jen can rely on is section 16b where she can be able to say that xx beauty deals in the trade of cosmetics and so there was an implied condition that xx beauty ought to have known uh, what this lipstick contains now of course that has been a long example but what i'm trying to show here is that if you go online order a particular good you're given a sample and it has been described to you then you discover that that description uh, from that manufacturer is actually i mean the product does that does not meet that description by the manufacturer and then in this case you can be able to rely on section 16b and section 16c now moving on to um the next point here what i was trying to emphasize is that goods are of a marketable quality if they are they are reasonable in the sense that they fit the purpose for which you are purchasing them remember in the example I've given jen is purchasing lipstick free from beeswax and good for african skin then in, in the event that she gets a lipstick that doesn't actually um or rather she gets lipstick that does in fact contain these uh, beeswax then she can be able to sue under section 16b and uh, 616c again the case here in question is uh, provided on the screen moving to the next key uh, implied condition as far as a sale of goods contract is concerned uh, this is section 17 of the sale of goods so remember at the back of your mind understand section 16b and section 17 as you can see from your screen so section uh, 617 emphasizes that the bulk of goods must correspond with the sample in quality so if you're buying a bulk of goods and you send for a sample you discover that sample is excellent that sample better match i mean the bulk that is later delivered to you better match the sample you first received this is as far as section 17 is concerned and the case in question here again is listed on your screen and to bring again the previous example i talked about now what if jen had no time to go to um xx beauty to inspect the lipstick but instead requested for a sample which is again sent to her and um, when she gets this sample um, she gives it to her friends and then the friends are able to send her good reviews uh, that this sample is great and when Jen realizes that her clients love the sample of the lipstick she purchased she goes ahead to purchase a bulk of uh, 500 tubes now as far as these tubes are concerned remember this bulk of five rather 5000 tubes must correspond to the sample that was first liked by Jen's uh, client so in this regard um, if after receiving the 5000 tubes later on maybe after the clients have used uh, these tubes they discover that in fact the lipstick contains a chemical which uh, bleaches african skin and causes allergies in this case of course when you see this um, what i'm trying to show here is that number one when the sample was delivered it was fantastic and a person has relied on that uh, aspect of the sample being fantastic to order over 5000 tubes and when these 5000 tubes are delivered uh, Jen starts to circulate among her friends three weeks later they discover that in fact this lipstick contains a chemical that is uh, uh, bleaching African skin and it's causing allergies and they suspect that it contains beeswax in this case the bulk does not correspond to the sample and that is contrary to section uh, 17 of the sale of goods act 
So remember that, remember section 16b, section 17. We have an aspect where we are talking about a bulk sample not corresponding to, uh, rather a bulk not corresponding to a sample that you sent for previously. What do you do in this case? Remember section 17. And so remember again up to this point, uh, support me by subscribing to my channel, comment so that I can be able to clear any misunderstandings that I made during the course of this video. But again, in continuation, um, I want us to break down the discussion we've had previously. So using the example of Jen I've given you uh, in, the, in the, the previous slides, in this case we found out that the bulk uh, did not correspond to the sample and so remember section 17 applies there. When it comes to section 16, um, section 16 does not make a distinction between a manufacturer and a supplier, meaning that beauty beauty, um, rather <laughs> XX beauty um, is a supplier and so they are still liable uh, for supplying uh, the bulk of the tubes that didn't correspond to the sample that was previously sent to Gem. So this is another key section that can apply in that scenario. Now, as far as that example is concerned, we, we, we talked about the bulk being able to correspond to the sample. Uh, we talked about um, a supplier being able again to offer those goods out of quality and uh, it doesn't the section 16 doesn't distinguish between a manufacturer and a supplier so you'll be able to apply section 16b and 17c and so moving ahead when it comes to section 17 remember again this is a recap section 17 applies in cases where we are talking about a bulk corresponding to a, a sample so when you see this in an exam that probably um, a bulk didn't correspond to a sample then you can be able to apply section 17 as a law student or um, remember this section at any time as you do your exams as you have a discussion yeah remember section 17 when it comes to bulk and sample so again just a reminder Jen received samples of lipstick from XX Beauty and gave some of her friends who gave the lipstick excellent uh, reviews and upon receiving this positive feedback, Jane placed an order of 5,000 tubes of lipstick, but the sample didn't uh, correspond to the bulk. So here you need to apply section 17. So in line with the previous discussion, also you need to look at uh, section 17c as far as Jenny's uh, situation is concerned, uh, because according to section 17c of the Sale of Goods Act, there is an implied condition that the goods shall be free from any defect, uh, rendering them unmarketable, which would not be apparent on reasonable examination of the sample. Being that the sample that was given uh, to Jen in this case was excellent. In fact, all her friends liked the product and they reviewed it with um, high regard. Then Jen relied on that sample to order for uh, 5,000 tubes which came with defects. So consider also looking at section 17 so that you understand that this is an implied condition in a sale of goods contract. So moving on to the next uh, implied condition as far as a sale of goods contract is concerned, uh, this is provided for under section uh, 15 that goods must correspond to the sample and description. So in this section 17 we are talking about one particular product being able to uh, to correspond to both the description and the sample and of course you can see the case uh, in, 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 in point. Now the other key uh, implied condition as far as sale of goods is concerned is the fact that uh, the goods you buy must uh, fit uh, the purpose for which you bought them. So if as a buyer you go to a seller and explain to them the quality of a good you need and what you need to use it for and the buyer tells you that they can provide that good, then they can be held liable under section 16A. So moving on to uh, the next uh, slide here, uh, just to emphasize what we've said, uh, if a buyer relies on a seller's skill, uh, maybe you go to someone, you want to buy a car, someone has been selling cars for years, uh, you rely on their skill and expertise to tell you that this is the best car uh, for, uh, for, for leisure and comfort and then you later on discover that actually 
this car has a lot of defaults because we relied on the skill of the seller uh, to acquire that car and remember that in this case that seller can be held liable also remember to read this case so that you understand uh, what happens uh, if uh, goods are sold under patents and trademarks this again takes you back to my videos on trademark law in Kenya so moving on to our last slide of course guys this was a long video I've shrubbed here and there but again I hope I've communicated if you've not understood anything please comment so that I can be able to respond to each of your comments but to give you an overview because we talked about so many sections I want you to break I want us to break down these sections so that you understand each one of them when we started by talking about uh, the fact that the seller must be the owner the rightful owner of a product upon uh, the time at which they transfer ownership to you that was section 14 remember where we started and then we came to section 15 that said that the sale of goods are by description and i want you to understand section 17 or rather section 15 because when you read it critically uh, at some point it talks about sale of goods by description yeah at the beginning of that section it talks about sale of goods by description but when you read it further it talks about a sale by sample as well as by description so understand section 15 very well so that you can see you can be able to tell a scenario where you're being asked about um, a sale of goods by description and another scenario where you're being asked about a sale of sample as well as uh, as well a seller of goods by sample as well as uh, by description so get a clear understanding of section 15 to understand why i'm bringing out this point the other key section we talked about was uh 16b i emphasized 16b throughout never forget 16b because it's a key section in sale of goods the other section was uh, section 17 we talked about how Jane suffered because of the tubes she had bought relying on a sample and the bulk must correspond to a sample and that is section 17 and lastly section 16a that uh, stated that uh, goods which are bought for a particular purpose uh, must actually fit that purpose and this brings us to the end of uh, this um, video uh, for any mistakes I made comment uh, in this in the comment section down there I'll respond to you if you have any question uh, questions as far as uh, this content is concerned for this particular video again comment I'll respond to you thank you so much I hope you understood excuse uh, my shrubbing but I'm happy to serve you anytime and remember uh, to subscribe to my channel in the next video watch out uh, for more um, discussions on sale of goods thank you